Sure, go for it. Oh wait, how do you do that, Ariel? Uh, it's the arrow thing in annotate. Yeah, Nidir, you have it. Okay, so um, the first section of the first chapter just deals with some fundamental concepts of set theory and logic. Um, I think most of us know that what a set is, well, there is no definition actually for a set in the textbook. Um, and uh, if you want a de definition, an axiomatic definition of a textbook, I guess we deal with that, uh, this in the uh, set theory reading seminars. But let A denote a set. And by a set, I mean just a thing that contains a bunch of other elements. It's not a very rigorous definition, but it, it's sufficient, I guess. And uh, A, lowercase a, is an element of the set. Um, and we denote A is in A. So this, this means that A is an element of this set. And if it's not an element, we just denote it like this. Um, so this is the notation. Um, so if you have two sets, A and B, um, you can have that A would be a subset of B, and you denote this by this. And that means that for all A in A, A is also in B. Um, uh, if A is, in B, is a subset of B, but a is, a is not B. Because if A is a subset of B, we can have that A is equal to B because a, su a set is a subset of itself. It satisfies the definition of a subset. Um, we call A a proper subset of B. Um, and it's denoted like this, I guess. Um, then we define the union of two sets. And this means x such that x is in a or x is in b um, what this or means is that x can be a member of a or an element of a or an element of b or both so it's not uh it's not if it's an element of both it's it's an element of the union and we also define an intersection uh by uh the set that contains elements x such that the x's are in A and x in B. Um, so if you ha when we define the intersection, we said that it's um, it has to be in A and in B, but you can have uh, two sets that uh, share no common elements and the intersection of A and B would have no elements, and we denote this by the empty set. And the empty set is defined as for all elements or for all objects that can be in certain sets. So these would be X's. Um, this relation holds. So it contains no elements. So the question is, um, is the empty set an element of A for all sets? What do you guys think? Hello? Maybe yes. Um, well, um, do you know how to prove this statement or disprove the statement? I think people from set theory seminar know it. So I think people who were not in the seminar should try themselves first. Okay, um, I can do the proof, or if you guys want, you could help me with it, tell me what you think. Um, or if you already know all this, we can just um, skip it. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna write the proof since no one is writing. Um, so we assume that there exists a set A. Well, I mean, we can just say that the, it's vacuously true because if we assume that X is in now, uh, uh, the empty set, that's a false statement and a false statement implies whatever statement we want. So it, if X is in uh, the empty set, then the empty set, it's in A and then 
um, the empty set is in A, but we can assume that the empty set that the empty set is not in. It. Wait, this was a mistake. Wait, how do you? Is not an A, then there exists an X that is in the empty set such that X is not. Wait, I'm making a lot of mistakes. Such that X is not an A, and this statement is wrong. So um, the assumption is uh, this assumption is wrong. Then we have for all sets the empty set is a uh, is an A. Um, we have the union of the empty set with any set A is the original set. Wait, and the was, like, was Nigeria's proof like clear for like everyone, especially for people who just like joined, like for example for Neil or yeah, for like people who didn't take set theory seminar? Um, like I got the gist of it, but could you like go over it again like slowly? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Um, we want to, so this is the statement for all sets A. Um, we have this. So the empty set is, an L, is uh, a subset of uh, this original set A. So we want to prove this. Um, and the way I did it, I said that we assume that there exists a set A such that this, for, for this set A, this relation does not hold. So we have the empty set is not a subset of A. And what this means, for uh, a set not to be a subset of another set, you must find an element in this set and this element would not be in this set and then it's not a subset because the definition is for all elements in this, they are also elements of this. So you just take the negation of that statement. And then you'd say, well, there exists an X in this, uh, in the empty set. And this X that, that's in the empty set is not in A. So this, these are equivalent statements. But this is wrong because you know that the empty set has no elements. So this cannot be true. So this is a contradiction. So the assumption, this assumption should be wrong. Thus, we have proved this uh, claim. Okay, I got you now, it makes sense, thanks. Um, you can also say, um, this is something in logic. I mean, if you have P implies Q, this is true. If P is false, wait, let me just, if P is false, this, Q can be either true or false, and the whole thing would still be true. So since you have um, this, you can prove this just by saying this. You can say X is, well, let me just. What I'm trying to say is that the statement can be proven to be vacuously true. Um, oh, I'm gonna go, go into this when I do this next thing, which is the contrapositive and the converse. Um, so given a statement, if P, then Q, its contrapositive would be if not Q, then not P. Um, and a statement, this is the definition of a contrapositive, and a statement and its contrapositive are logically equivalent. And uh, we can draw a proof table. So this is P, this is Q. And if P, then Q is just P implies Q. And um, if not Q, then not P is just not Q implies not P. And let's say false, false. So the only way this can be um, false if, is, is if uh, P is true and uh, Q is false. So all of them are true. And the same thing holds for this. If, Q, if not Q is false, if not Q is true, 
and uh, not p is true. So if uh, q is false and p is true, so it's this. And all of them are true. So these two are logically equivalent. Um, the other thing is the converse of a statement. So the converse of p implies q is q implies p. And these are not necessarily logically equivalent. And if you have these two are both true, you have p is equivalent to q. So if you want to show that p is equivalent to q, just show that p implies q and q implies p. Um, the next thing in the textbook that they deal with is negation of statements. Um, and they talk about that the negation of for all is there exists. So if you want to prove that a statement that says for all x in some set, you can just show that there you have the relation px. You can just show that there exists an x in the set such that um, if you want to if you want to prove that that's wrong, you just show that this is there exists an x such that this is so, so, such that not p x. And if that's true. Um, then the or original one is proven. You, you can do some things with proofs like that. Um, and then we have a difference of sets. A minus B is just the set X such that X is in A and X is not in B. Um, and this can be written a different way. It's just A. Um, intersection B bar. And if you have the union, uh, the, uh, a universe that all of these sets are in, this would just be the complement of B. So you have B intersection B bar is the empty set and the union is just this one. Um, and then we, we have some rules um, that A intersection B union C is a intersection B union A intersection C. If my writing is not correct, if is not clear, just let me know because it's really hard to write and I can just uh, rewrite them again. Um, uh, what do you call about proving those statements? Um, okay, sure. Um, well, you'd assume X is in the first set and then you'd show that it's in the second set and then that gives you the first, um, so wait, let me say something. If you wanna show that A, a set A is equal to a set B, you show that A is a subset of B and that B is a subset of A. So first, if to show this, you assume an X in the first A, and then you say that this implies X is in B. And for this one, X in B implies X in A. And then you have shown the, uh, the the equality of the sets. Um, so for these things, we just assume that X is in the first one, and then we we can say, well, then X is. Wait, let me let me actually do the first one. And the second one would be an exercise for the readers. <laughs> um, X is in A intersection B union C. We can say that X is in A, and X is in B union C. And if X is in A, then X is in A union B. Wait, yeah, no, no, that's wrong. Actually, yeah, that's correct, but that's not what we're trying to prove. Okay. And then X is in A and X. Wait, no. <laughs> okay, I apologize for this. Let me rewrite this. I don't know if this would make sense, but um, if you have X is in A and it's either in B or in B or C, you can have that X is in A or, wait, no, and 
it's in B or X is in A and in C. So these both, they are equivalent because if you have X is in A or, and it's in either one of those, well, you have X is in A and, or, and X is in B or the other, because it's in A in either cases and it's either in B or C. So this is how you prove the first uh, one, the first, uh, that the first one is a subset of the second one, and then you do another, the same thing over again to show the other side. Um, then we have the Morgan's law, laws. And the Morgan's laws are, are also laws of logic. So A minus B union C is A minus B. It's not how it intersection A minus C. And then we have a collection of sets. And the collection of sets is just a set that has as elements other sets. Um, and then we define the power set. Wait, I think there are like more than we're gun lost. I think there are like at least yeah. three. I thought there, there were two. Wait, let me see. I, I just wrote one. And the second one is just uh, for the intersection. This is the second one. Well, let me, I, I don't know if there are three actually. What's the third one? Yeah, you're right, I think there are two. Okay. Um, and um, as a, we have a, the power set of A, it's just the collection of all subsets of A. And it's called the power set of A because the cardinal of the power set is 2 to the n. And this can be shown by induction. Um, and then we have the Cartesian products. And uh, I guess everyone is, uh, knows what Cartesian products are, at least for two sets. And um, I'll we'll cover the, the Cartesian yeah, products. It's, yeah, it's, it's in a different section. So um, the second section is functions. Um, and well, a function is just a rule that assigns to each element of a set A an element of a set B. And to define uh, what a rule is, a rule of assignment, well, there is a definition. Of rule of assignment. Um, it would be really hard to write what the definition is, so I'm just going to read it. Um, a rule of assignment is a subset um, R of the Cartesian product C times D of two sets, um, having the property that each element of C appears as the first coordinate of at most one ordered pair belonging to R. Um, thus, a subset R of C times D uh, is a rule of assignment if um, this would be the rule. C, D is in R. R is a rule of assignment. And C prime is also in R. It implies that D is equal to D prime. So these, this appears once. The C appears once in uh, at, at most, uh, in at most one ordered pair belonging to this R, which is the rule of assignment. It's just a, a way of it. Yeah. Well. I think functions would make more sense if you explain Cartesian products first, because even if so people met them in like their geometry classes or whatever, like then you don't know the proper definition of it. Yeah, sure. Um so the Cartesian product of two sets is A times B. Um so if is this ordered pair, which is different from this this pair, by the way. I can take over if you want me to. 
Nadir. Uh, is, um, well, I mean, this is just for it's just for the to explain okay. for more. Okay. You'll deal with them in like infinitely many Cartesian yeah. products, right? So, so I'm just gonna write them. And B, a B is in B. So it's this uh, ordered pair that belongs. This is the Cartesian product, and we can define it as AB is equal to this set. This is not very. We can define the Cartesian product in set notation like this. So it's just this order pair, such that this belongs to this and this one belongs to this one. I don't know if it makes sense. If you if it's not clear, oh, please let me know. Um, so we can think of this rule of assignment. Let me just rewrite what a rule of assignment is. So the rule of assignment at R is a subset. of this Cartesian product um, if, well, it's a rule of assignment if, um, Um, let me check. There are some questions in the message. Um, and then we define um, the domain of R of this rule of assignment. Um, as uh, the set of all seeds such that there exists a D in this, the set that we arrive at such that CD is in R. And the image as the set of all these such that there exists a C in C such that CD again is in R. And then we define a function. And a function is a rule of assignment, um, but it has a set B that contains the image sets, uh, that contains the image set of R. And the domain A of R is also called the domain of the set, uh, the function F. So it's so a function like this from a set, um, say R plus to R, is different from a function G from R plus again to R plus, even though they might have the same rule of assignment. So this is what they mean when they say it's together with a set B that contains the image set of R. So the image set of these the, the R R is in R. But when we restrict it to this set, it's a different function. And well, we can say that one of them could be bijective, one of them could, could be surjective, and this is what we're gonna do next. So the, the set B is called the range of F. And we say that F, if a function goes from A to B, we say that um, F, maps A into B. Um, then we denote F of A as the unique element. Of B. Uh, that the rule of uh, of assignment 
of f are assigned to a in a and it's called the value of this a at r the value of f at a so um f a denotes the unique b the unique element in B such that A F of A is in R. And this is the rule of assignment that determines B and that determines F. Um, and what I said before about restrictions, we can also restrict the, the, the domain of F. So if we have F went from A mapping A into B um, and A sub zero is a subset of A, we define the restriction where F to A sub zero to be the function. Um, such that A is in A sub zero. So we change the domain of F to restrict it to a subset of the original domain. And we denote this by F restricted to A sub zero. Uh, and then we define the composite of two functions. Um, then the definition would be, well, we have f that maps a into b, and another function g that maps b into c. Uh, the composite of the two functions that we denote by this thing, I don't know how to, um, what's, what's it called in, in English? Um, this composite of f and g as the function, let me write the, what the function is. Uh, it's this going from mapping A into C and defined by the equation of A is equal G of F of A. And if we want to define it formally, it's this is the function whose rule is for some b in b such that f of a is equal to b and g of b is equal to c. These, they mean the same thing, but this is more formal. Oh, is everything clear until now? Okay, yes, that means yes. Um, then we define what I said earlier about injective functions, surjective functions, and bijective functions. And uh, we're gonna do some proofs. Um, so we define what an injective function is first. So these are definitions. An injective function, or a one to one function, is the function f that maps a into b. Um, if um, f a equals f a prime implies that a equals a prime. So what, what this means is that for each pair of distinct points of a, um, their image under f are distinct. So they map to, if these are different, they map, if these are different, they would map to different f's, but if to different images which would be f of a which would be b in the set b and so this would map to b and this would map this would map to right this would map to b and this would map to b prime and they would have to be different if they're not different they're equal so this this is what it means to be an injective function um a surjective function is again it's a function that maps a to b and 
subjective means until. And um, it means that for every element in this set B, uh, the, every element is the image of some element of A under F. So it means that, that for every B in B, there exists an A in A such that B equals F of A. And um, bijective uh, means that they are both. So for every B, uh, uh, and in a bijective function is both injective and surjective. So for every B in B, uh, there exists a unique A in A such that B equals F of A. This would mean this means that there exists a unique. So this this stresses the uniqueness of the A. Um, and uh, my claim is that a composite of two injective functions. Is wait is injective, and that the composite of two subjective functions is subjective. So, what do you guys think? Is this correct, or is it wrong? Okay, so let's do the proof. Um, it is my claim. I claim that it's correct. So let G and F be two injective functions. F maps A to B and G maps B to C. Um, to prove that they're injective, um, we let A and A prime in A uh, be different. Wait, what? let's not claim that they're different. It's not necessary. And G of F of A equals G of F of A prime implies, because this is injective, this implies that F of A is equal to F of A prime. And because this is injective, this implies that A is equal to A prime. And this means that uh, the composite of the two functions is also injective. And for a subjective function, we just have to find um, an A for every B we choose. And it's not very complicated. Um, but I could do the proof if you guys want, want to. Do you want me to skip it or do you want me to do the proof? How about okay, people well, try to come up with idea of proof? Wait, what? How about people try to like think of a, how the proof would go? Okay. You guys, any ideas? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, what are we guys trying to to prove? So to prove that a function is subjective, what do what do we do? What should we do? So what we do is that we pick a C in this set, um, and we we should we should prove that this implies that there exists an A in the original set A, the domain, such that G of F of A is equal to C. So we're trying to find this A. Um, so I'm going to take a C in C randomly. Uh, and since, uh, since G there must be 
what do you mean but by there must be a function mapping every element in C to A? Because the function is maps A to C, and we're just trying to, well, I guess, I guess, yeah, we find a C such that um, F, well, the, this function, the image of A, there exists a pre-image. Wait, are you trying to sh say that there should be like an inverse function? No, no, no. No, not an inverse function, just oh, some okay. kind of map from, so every uh, element in C will have a pre-image in A is what. Yeah, yeah exactly. it, it's not necessarily a function. It's just that there is a. An okay, a. there's a mapping, okay. Because to be an inverse function, there has to be unique A. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which will be the next condition with bijector, right? Yeah. Um, so since G is subjective, we know um, that there exists a B in B such that G of B is equal to C. Um, and then since F is also subjective, we know that there exists an A in A such that F of A is equal to B. And well, this would just mean that um, G of F of A is equal to C because F of A is B. And then we have found this the A that we, we were trying to find uh, and then it's surjective. So decomposite of two injective functions uh, is injective and the composite of two subjective functions is surjective, then the composite of two bijective functions is bijective. Um, we can prove that the composite of two bijective functions is bijective. Um, but um, I'm just going to skip it, I guess. So there's a lemma um, that says let f be a mapping from A, a function that maps A into B, if there are functions G from B to A and H from B to A, such that um, I'm going to erase because there is no uh, space to write, but I'm going to write, write where G and H are. B to A and H and B to A, such that G of F of A is A for every A in, for every A, this is for, for all A, and F of H of B is equal to B for every B, then F is bijective, and g equals h equals f equals the inverse of f this means the inverse of f if because f is bijective there is a an inverse um we can also prove this and the proof is uh an exercise in the textbook it's exercise five and uh to do this we just follow the steps in exercise five um i should we prove it or should we do it as an exercise later? What do you guys want? Okay, I'll give you a couple minutes, like one or two minutes to think about the proof. You can look at the exercise five and try to do the steps or write an outline and I do the proof and I come in.
Can someone repeat me as a given? I'm sorry, I wasn't here for a second. Oh, what? Oh, so I, 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 wait, let me, let me. So the lemma was that if, if I, I wrote the lemma and I was giving the guys like a couple minutes to think about the proof. Um, so the lemma was like, if F maps A into B and if there are functions G and H both mapping A into B into A, such that G of F of A is A for every A in A and F of H of B is B for every B in B, then F is bijective and G equals H equals F uh, equals the inverse of F. Um, so I was thinking of doing a proof, but maybe I'll just skip it. Um, the proof is in exercise five if you want to do it, and I can send the proof later in the in the group chat. Wait, let's not skip it. How about we try to like see if people actually understand what, what you were talking about? Because that's like the only way we can understand if they understood, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, let me tell you what page the exercise is in, and uh, we can do it. Uh, It's in page 21. Yeah, I actually just read the exercise, please. And if you haven't read it, I can tell you what the exercise says, because at first it defines what an identity function is. And we use that in the proof. And it would be very tedious to rewrite what an identity function is. So. If you don't want to do the proof, just let me know when you finish reading, and I'll just do it quickly for people who are interested in the proof. Um, so, are you done reading? Well, I, I, at least I'm done. Uh, how about you guys? Okay, I'm, I'm going to assume everyone... Oh, well, I'm going to assume not everyone read. And I'm just going to say what an identity function is. So, an identity function for a set, let, let's denote the set C, is this function that uh, that's from C into C and that for every element in the set X in C I C of X is equal these the element so it, it's like F of X equals X for R at least for for every actually every <laughs> um, so yeah and a left inverse of a function um, if F is from A to B and G is from B into A, a left inverse is this function. If, if this function is the identity, is the identity function for the set A and H that maps B, this is, this should be a B. B into A is a right inverse. If um, F composite H is equal, the identity function for the set B, because this maps from B to A, this maps from B to A, and this would map A right in, again to B. So it should be an identity for B. Um, so we first show, that if F has a left inverse, if F has a left inverse, it is injective. Um, so we do the standard thing, let A and A prime in A, and F of A is equal F of A prime, right? This implies that G of f of a is equal 
did she? Let me don't have much space. So this is G F A is equal to G F A prime. And since this is the identity for the set, this is a left inverse. So the left inverse would would dot if this is a light a right inverse, this is equal the identity for the set A. And since this this is an element in A, this would imply that A is equal to A prime. And thus, F is injective. So the other way would be uh, if F has a left right inverse, uh, it is subjective. So if it has a left inverse, it is injective. And if it has a right inverse, it is subjective. So let's take an element B. Oh, wait, how about how about people try to like prove it? Because so far. Like we didn't see people actually understood like anything, so we have to like give them a try or maybe, especially because yeah, the two sure. proofs are very similar. So guys, hint the first, like the second proof would be very similar to the the first proof. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna write what the what we're trying to do. If F has a eighteen plus. I'm gonna give you guys like two minutes and um, let me know if you finish before. Um, so, are you done? Hey, who yeah, we need a uh, super mind's help. <laughs> or Theodore. Okay, but guys, feel free to just throw like even incomplete proofs, like just like even like rough ideas of what you think should be done. Do you have any hint? Sorry, can you repeat again? Do you have any hint? Oh yeah. Um, so to show that a function is subjective, um, you should take an, a random element in the set of images, um, which is B in this case. And then you'd, you'd want to find an A in the set of in the domain such that um, f of a is equal to b, so that's what you're trying to define. But here you know that um, that the function has a right inverse, so you have to use this to find the a. So you just you want to start with a b in this in the set of images, and then you want to keep going with the, uh, logical implications until you reach uh, a line that says b is equal to f of a, and then you're done. You'd have that f is subject. And we use a similar um, method to do, if it makes sense. It's, it's very close to what we did before. Um, it's actually not very long. So 
If, what we have to prove is basically that for any element of the set B, which is a range, there is a yeah. pre-image, right? Yeah. And so by because we have H, it means that like you have a specific map from B to A, which can help because yeah. and you also know it's an identity function. So yeah. Yeah. any any suggestions? I'm still writing and thinking on it. I will let you know if I come up with something. Yeah. Uh, Kang? Mm -hmm. What do you think about it? Uh, I have some rough ideas, but I don't know whether it is right. So what are your rough ideas? Share with us. So like, suppose we have a uh, element B in the set B, and uh, we need to show that um, for every B there is a uh, an element, uh, say B prime, such that F B prime equals B, right? So, so um, no, based on we show that F of B prime is equal to B, and B prime should be in A in the set A. Ah uh, yeah, yeah yeah. So, uh, like uh, what we like. What we know is that, uh, like we can first construct uh, like the right inverse. We can use it, uh, f compose h like b um, equals i b identity b equals b right, uh, and uh, so we can write it as f h b equals b. That means for every b there is h uh, b like. Uh, in A such that F, uh, F B prime equals B. Well, I actually think that was like a complete proof if you just like yeah. say it like more precisely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that solves the problem. <laughs> How about we just try to like write it down carefully, understand what he said. Sure. Okay, so what we do is we take an element in B like you suggested and then we say that, um, so we know that H is a mapping from B to A. So we know that there exists an A in A, such that H of B is equal to A, because this maps this into this. So we know that there exists an A such that this holds. And then we use the fact that it is the right inverse. So we do this, B is equal to F of A. And since this is the identity in, on B, and this is an element in B, this would be B, and this would be F of A. And then we have found that there exists, um, we have found this, and then F is surjective. So yeah. Um, so then we, the next step is to prove that, um, H is equal to G is equal to the inverse of F. So we first show that F is uh, bijective. And uh, this is not very hard because we know that since F has a left inverse, it is injective. And since it has a right inverse, it is surjective. Thus, since it is both injective and subjective, it is bijective. And it has a right inverse. So next, we have to exploit the fact that this is correct. To show, well, no, this is not correct, actually. Um, no, wait. Don't make a mistake. Sorry, yeah. can you say again what you just said? Yeah, I made a mistake. No, no. It's just this. I had the correct, the right, the right. So this is an identity on F because this maps from F maps from A into B and G maps again from B into A. So we have to exploit this fact to show that uh, at least G is equal to F minus one, which is the inverse function of F. And we can do this by, um, since we know that this function at least exists, we can do the composite of this, this function with this function. And we do the composite with, again, with F negative one. And this would be I, okay? Oh, sorry. 
the inverse. Can I, uh, I, 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 I kind of get lost to like, what are you assuming now? Are you assuming now that like a function has an inverse and you're trying to prove that the left inverse is equal to right inverse or what are you doing no. specifically? Uh, so this is just, uh, we're completing the problem because the problem assumed that F has a left inverse and that F has a right inverse. Um, so we're trying to show that the left inverse is equal to the right inverse is equal to the actual inverse. So we first, first have to show that F has an inverse. Um, and since we know it's bijective, we know that this exists. Right? We showed it at the first part of the problem. Well, it's, it's a direct um, result of the first part of the problem. Wait, let me let me rewrite this. So you're just saying that if it has both left and right inverse, it's bijective and the inverses are equal. Okay, sure. Yeah. Well, we show that f is injective and that f is surjective. Then it is bijective and has an inverse. Now we are trying to show that the left inverse equals the right inverse equals the the the, the inverse function of f, which is f negative one. Sorry, uh, when did we show exactly that a bijective function has one inverse? Uh, by, if a function is bijective, it has an inverse. Wait, but did we, did we really prove that? No, we did not. Well, wait, let me, let me check my notes. <laughs> I may have not paid an atten attention to this. Maybe I did not mention it. I'm not sure how would you specifically prove that there exists one inverse function without introducing left and right inverses because yeah I, I know a proof of how you can like show that there is an inverse function by having left and right but I don't know how you do it before having left and right so I'm not sure we really did that or you can do that so, without. Um, the question is um, how do you show that if a function is bijective it has an inverse right Uh, yes, but without using left and right inverses because okay. So the existence of the inverse is the question. <clears throat> well, I am not sure I tackled this actually. I may have just mentioned that if it is a bi if it is a bijective function, it has an inverse, but I don't think I proved it. So I would have to do it after the lecture, I guess, and I would send it in the group chat. Is that okay? Yeah, sure, but like I honestly don't know how would you do that. Um, oh, yeah, I have no idea too. <laughs> yeah, so I, I have think. To do, yeah, I think you can. You, you you can show that there is an inverse function, but you will have to uh, use left and right inverses first. So you will have to complete the five e problem first to get an inverse function, which yeah. is doable. Yeah. Uh, but then um, this, this, my proof for the next part would fall apart because I actually assumed that there is an, uh, uh, an, an inverse function and then I showed that it's equal to the right and the left inverse. So the assumption that it's there fine. exists, uh, yeah, so I have to do that. If not, I'm going to revise my proof for this one and uh, I'm going to see if I can do another proof. Sure. I, uh, there's actually, <laughs> I apologize. Nice, there's actually a nice trick which I think, um, like, you know, because you were in the abstract algebra, and I think Gorf know because he was in linear algebra, like, and I think you did it in linear algebra too. Does it, you know a trick that can help you do that, I think. Yeah, should work. Okay, so um, I'm gonna do the proof, and I'm gonna send the rest um, in the group chat. Um, just. Well, I'm going to write it here. OK, thank you. OK, so um, the composite of G and F is the identity on A. And then this implies since, well, let me write here, we assume that 
the inverse exists because it is bijective. So we know that f is bijective and the assumption that it is not proven is that it has an inverse because it is bijective. Um, so the next thing is uh, we do the composite of this function with the inverse function and then this is equal to the identity and the composite with the inverse function. And since this is the ident, this is, this would, this would be the identity on B. So this would be the composite of G and the ident identity on B. And this would be just F, the inverse. And this would still be G. So then we have proved that G is equal to the inverse. Um, and for the other way around, we just do the same thing. We just f with f of h is equal to the, the identity on b. And we do the same steps, and we show that h is equal to the inverse. Um, then there is a definition, and we are done with functions, and we go to relations, which are a special type of a rule of assignment. Um, so we let f. f maps a into b and a sub zero is a subset of a uh, we denote by f of this subset of a um to be the set of images of points of a sub zero so the point the set of images of points of a sub zero. And what this means under the function f, of course. So what this means formally is that f of a sub zero is equal to b such that b is equal to f of a for at least one. A and A sub zero. So I, I guess all of you are familiar with this in a calculus class, I guess. Um, so this is just a set of images. And then if B sub zero is a subset to B and um, F has an inverse, we denote by F. Well, I don't think it necessarily has to have an inverse. Um, this is the set of pre images. And if it is an inverse, um, then we, this would just be a function, let, we can name it G and we could apply this definition. But for this, we don't need to, to have an inverse. It's just A, it's just a set of A such that F of A is in B sub zero. Um, and then we have an interest in relation between the set of, uh, the um, set of, uh, pre-images and images and the original sets. So A sub zero is inclu is a subset of F negative one of F of A sub zero. So we do not have actually equality here. And um, there are examples in the textbook that illustrate why this is and an exercise um, that shows when there is equality. The equality is when the equality holds when f is injective. Um, and then this would not be surprising again since we saw the first one. B is a subset of f of f negative one, a sub zero, b sub zero. Oh, wait. And again, okay. And how would you go about proving that? Because if you don't, we probably should try proving that. Because that's like a new fact, which is important. Yeah, sure. I have not prepared the proof, so we can do it together if you want. Yeah, sure. Doing together is fine. I just like, do you guys? 
do, do you guys want to prove that the equality holds when it's subjective or injective, or do you want to prove that it's included in the subset? Um, Holly, you get to choose. Oh, wait, is Holly here? Wait, let me, let me rewrite this. My, my handwriting is very bad. All right, Neil, you choose. <laughs> Just choose whatever you want. Uh, I mean, I have no preference whatsoever, to be honest. Well, how about we prove the more general <laughs> fact that B zero is in the F, F minus one B zero? Because that's like a more useful fact, I guess. Why don't we show that A sub zero is to N F negative one of F of A sub zero? Sure, sounds great. Okay. So help me out with the proof because I have not done it before and I'm not sure I'd be able to, to do it on the spot. So let A be an A sub zero. Um, okay. So um, we want to show. That um, A is in F. Okay, so this is what we have, and this is what we're going to show. Um, so we have A is in A sub zero. So we know that F of A is in f of a sub zero, right? And this is equal to b. There exists a b and a b. Um, so what, what do we do next? <laughs> so this is next. Maybe you can define f, uh, like f of a to be some kind of b. And then you say that f, yeah, okay. in, like inverse of f out of b, by definition, I'm not sure we can do this because, um, wait, let me. Um, so you're saying we'd say f of a is equal to b for some b in b, right? Is this what we're trying to show? Yeah, sure. That, that, uh, we just make the notation easier. We don't really have to do that, but sure, why not? Wait, let me rewrite it. So there exists a B in B such that um, F of A is equal to B. Then we have B is in F to A sub zero, right? And what do we do next? Well, how about we look at the properties of the inverse of F? But like the we, way we define we, inverse of F? Yeah, but we don't necessarily have an inverse because we did not assume that f is a bijective function. So well, the set of uh, the three images does not. So a function can a set can have a set of three images under yeah, f sure. without f being. Yeah. Sure. That, that 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 that's like they still would would let you uh basically if you like even even that you would you would just be able to say that inverse of f of B yeah. would just be a set of all pre-images of B where yeah. uh, A is also is the set of the pre-images, right? So it's and like denoting this F of A sub zero by B sub zero, right? Uh, and I would say that B sub zero? it's just a notation because um, well, we can't, we cannot do this. I don't think we don't have to. Yeah, I mean, it's still whole, uh, it's just like, to be prettier because it would be just a direct statement of the definition. But yeah, so f of, f of a sub zero uh, would be the set of a's such that um, f of a is in b. Well, in this case, is in f of a sub zero, right? Wait, and, why, uh, why do we have wait. to do f a sub zero, how about we just write f b, like 
because that would make it shorter and like more to the point and less general. So if we if you just write inverse of f f b and define it. B, like this. No, you're a little b, like the b which is the image of a, because that's what we care about, right? But this assumes the existence of the because this is a number. This would be a well, not a number, but this would be an element in a set. But uh, we def we only defined f this. Of a of a bigger set oh, because sorry sorry only, sorry yeah. wait sorry yeah I I got confused so how about we just write f uh inverse f of b and just show what it means I'm so not not sure. and so if we just write inverse f of b and explain what it means like this, of little b yep so what would that mean. Oh uh, well, that's just a, like a set of pre-images of B, right? Oh, oh, so it's just okay. So it's not a function, but it's a set, and it's a set of A's such that f of A is equal to B, right? Yep. And we know that our okay. initial A that we yeah. were looking for is in the set. Okay. So yeah, A is in this, and this is this is a subset of f negative one of f of a sub zero. Okay, so we have proved it. Yay. Okay. Oh, yeah, that was easy. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so this was the last thing we had in functions. Um, and we're going to move to relations. But before we go, uh, hey guys, did you understand what just happened? Because it's important that you do. <laughs> yeah, if you guys have a question or do you, if you want me to rewrite the proof, I, I'd be happy to. If not, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move to relations if that's fine. Uh, hey, Theodora, was the proof understandable? Um, I'm sorry. I kind of missed the part where we started the proof, so I'm I'm not really sure. Okay, I can I can go over the proof again. So a sub zero, we want to show that a sub zero is a subset of this set. Okay, so we take an a in a sub zero, right? And then we say that there exists a B uh, such that F of A is equal to B. And then we defined a set F negative one of B, which is the set of all pre images A such that F of A equals to B. And we have that this set is in F of negative one of A sub zero. Um, no, this is an F, wait, B, let me rewrite this thing. B is in F of A sub zero, and this, this would be in F negative one of F of A sub zero. And since we know that A is in this subset because it satisfies the requirement to be in the subset. We know that it is in this subset, in this set, and thus the a sub zero is a subset of this subset of this set. Does it make sense? I know that I'm just circling words now because it's the it's not very clear. But I can rewrite it if you want, or I can write it on a piece of paper and send it on the group chat. It makes sense. Thank you. I actually got it this time. Okay. okay great. Um, so next we have relations, and uh, well, we define define what a relation is. Um, and uh, well, a relation on a set A is 
is a subset of the Cartesian product. Let, let's denote the subset C of the Cartesian product. A times A. Um, so um, you might remember what a rule of assignment is. And a rule of assignment is a, a rule assignment for a function would also be a subset. For if a function goes from A to A, uh, would also be a subset of, a, of this Cartesian product. And uh, it is a relation. But it is not. But a relation is not a function, because a function, uh, each element of uh, a has to appear as the first coordinate for an element of R exactly once. So you have any subset of a of the Cartesian product is a relation, but it's not a function. But every function is a relation. Um, so if C is in a relation is a relation on A, we use X, C, Y to the note that X and Y are in C. And C is just, uh, again, it's a subset of the Cartesian product. And we can say that X is in relation C with Y. And we can denote it also like this. This relation can be equality, for example. Um, and yeah, we'll, we then move to equivalence relations and uh, equality is uh, an example of an equivalence relation. Oh wait, Nadir, I think, how about you try to like give people an example, like even just a real life example, what is a relation so they have an intuitive sense of what that is. Um, okay, yeah. So a relation, let's take the, this is a fun example. I guess it's also in the book. Um, a relation, let's take the set of all humans and let's take the Cartesian products of the set of humans and the set of humans. So we'd say that and define the relation of um, what, what, what's a fun relation we define? Well, let's just define parenthood. Um, we'd say that um, your father is in a relation of parenthood with you because he's your, your father and your mother, but um, you're not the parent of your father, so that relation would only go in one way. So if you are in a relation, this relation that we define P with your father, your father is not in a relation P with you. So that's uh, an example of a relation. It can be anything, as long as it's between the sets, as long as it's between the, the elements of the same set. Um, and it can be anything, literally anything. It doesn't have to be, there are like some uh, um, like equivalence relations, like they have some um, properties they have to, to uh, they have to, yeah, the, I forgot the word, but that. Um, but not every, every subset of uh, a Cartesian product of a set and itself is a relation. So that was an example. Do you need, if you, do you want another example or is it clear? Or did I just make matters worse? I think it's clear. Okay. Okay. Uh, so then we move to equal, equivalence relations. And equivalence relations on the set e, A uh, uh, is a relation. C on A, but it satisfies three properties. So the first property is re reflexiv re reflexivity. So what that means if, is that X should be in a relation with itself for every X in A. And the second one would be symmetry. So that would be if, if, X is in relation with Y, then 
y is in the relation with x, the same relation. And the third one, we need transitivity. And that means if x is in relation with y and y is in relation with c, then x is in relation with c. So, um, yeah, we can take equality, for example. So x is equal to x for all x in a set A if we define this, this relation on a set A. And if x is equal to y, then y is equal to x. And if x is equal to y and y is equal to z, then x is equal to z. Um, and we can denote equivalence relations like this. This would be an equivalence relation. So what would be an example of a equivalence relation? Uh, equality would be an example. Um, yeah, equality would be an example. Um, so what, what's the difference between direct equality and an equivalence relation? Uh, equality is an example of an equivalence relation. Like there are lots of equivalence relations as long as they satisfy the properties that I listed, uh, it would be an equivalence relation. And equality is just an example. Okay. Um, so then we can define um, a subset. Like let's say that um, we define an equivalence relation on A, right? And uh, an element, we have an element. An element X in A, we can define a subset E of A, such that E is defined like this is a set of all y's such that y is in relation with x. And it's called an equivalence class. Equ equivalence class determined by x. Um, so, um, one interesting thing we have is that two equivalent classes E and E prime are either equal or disjoint. And this joint means that their uh, intersection is the empty set. So, um, proof. And uh, I give you guys uh, again a minute or two, and uh, let me know when you're done thinking about the problem. So, do you remember it, or should I write it again? Or should I just do the proof? Okay, I'll, I'll just do the proof. So we denote EY, the equivalence class, determined by y. And remember what this means. It is just a set of all elements such that y is well, in an equivalence relation with a. This is what the ey means. It's determined by y. Um, and the ex, the equivalence relation determined by x. Uh, and next, we want to show that they're either um, disjoint or equal. 
So we suppose that they are not disjoint. And then we show that they're equal. So now this joint will be EY intersection EX is non empty. And we show that they're equal. Okay, so EY intersection EX is non empty. This implies that there exists Z that is in EY and C in EX. That means that Z is in equivalence relation with Y and Z is in equivalence relation with X. And by reflexivity, we have um, Y is in relation with C and C is with X. And we use the transitivity and we say that y is in relation with x and this would mean that um well this means that they're in equivalence relation x is in an equivalence relation with y we next show that ey is equal to ex so we now have that y is in equivalence relation with x and we show that ey is equal to ex we first show that uh, ex is a subset of ey and we take an a in EX, we have A is in a relation with X. This implies, since this Y, X is in relation with Y, we have A is in relation with Y, and we have A is in EY. Thus, EX is a subset of EY, and we do the same thing to show that EY is a subset of the equivalence relation, equivalence class of X, and then we have that they're equal. Was this clear? Dane, honestly, I had to go for a second, so I missed like the first part. What page is that? Um, wait, let me see. Um, I'm not sure. Um, oh, so I guess 23. Wait, was oh. that? Yeah, that was. Uh, yeah, that was Lama 3.1. Okay, sure. Also, a quick question. I think it was like already an hour and a half, and like usually we have breaks in the middle, and like, but like you're welcome to do break whenever you want. Just like, yeah, keep in mind you can you can have a break. Uh, let me see how much we're gonna cover. Um, we don't have that much. Um, we can take a break now, but I guess um I can finish this quickly, and then we can take a break because Gorav is gonna present the next. Uh, chapters in the next section uh, I need to go though because I I planned for three hours and um, it's almost one and a half so that's why I, I'm not sure if we can take like a very long break maybe like 10 minutes yeah yeah sure okay thanks okay I'm, I'm gonna finish now quickly and uh, I'm gonna let you present okay so um, did you see, uh, so Aya, did you see the lemma? Did I like tell you how I proved it? And I guess it's a similar proof that, to the one they use in the textbook, so I don't think it's oh, Yeah, yeah, I checked it out, thanks. Uh -huh. So next we have a corollary. And that says that um, if let this, this equivalence relation be on a set X, be defined on a set X, and X and Y are elements of the set, then EX equals EY is, um, if and only if X is in relation with Y. Um, next, we have the definition of a partition. Um, and the partition, of a set X is a collection P of subsets of X that satisfy the following. 
Okay, so the first is for all A. Wait. Yeah. So P is a collection of subsets of uh, subsets. Yeah. So the elements of uh, of P are going to be sets. So we have for all elements of this collection, they are not empty. And X is equal to the union. These sets and three for all sets A and B. Wait. Okay. In P, A intersection B is different from the, is not the empty set implies that A equals B. Um, and then, um, well, equivalence relations and partitions are the same thing. So what I mean by that is saying that if we have an equivalence relation on a non-empty set X, and then the set P is equal to the partitions. Uh, well, the set E, let me just write that. I, I can do a proof of this, or if you want, I can just send it um, in the group chat. And we can move to order relations. So let Then is a partition. So this is saying that a, an equivalence relation can be a partition. The, set, the collection of all equivalence relations is a partition of the set X. And the second part says that. Um, if P is a partition of X, then the relation defined by the, this relation defined by X and Y, if X and Y are elements of A for some A in the partition, it is an equivalence is an equivalence relation on X. Um, do you guys want the proof of this or do you want me to just send it later? Um, I guess I'm, I'm just gonna send it later because we don't have much time. And I'm gonna do all the relations. Um, so a relation C on A is an order relation. if it satisfies the following properties again. So comparability, so that means for every X and Y in A, for which X is not Y, uh, either X is in relation C with Y, or Y is in relation C with X. Um, non-reflexivity, so that means for no x in A does the relation hold. X is in relation with x. So this holds for no element x and C in A. And the third one is if is transitivity again. That means if X is in relation C with Y and Y is in relation C with C, then X is in the relation C with C. And we use this to denote an order relation. 
Um, then we have the following definition. So we have a set X, and this is an order relation on X. Um, if A less than B, well, not less than B, in the this relation, if A is in this order relation with B, we use the notation AB to denote the set X such that this holds. And what this means is that X, A is in relation, is in this relation with X, and X is in the same relation with B. And while well, this can, in, in the real numbers and the usual definition of the disorder relation, we can say that this is an interval. It's, it's also called an interval here, but we, you might have heard of it before in this context. Uh, if the set is empty, we call A the immediate predecessor of B and B the immediate successor of A because there is no X in between, if you can. So then we have a set of other definitions. I'm just gonna read them so as not to take a long time. Um, so well, I'm, I'm gonna write them, I guess it's better because it has a lot of notation. So if A and B are two sets with all the relations this, and this is the order relation on B, Uh, then we say that A and B have the same order type if there is a bijective correspondence. So we, we, we want to define, define what a same order type means. And this means if there is a bijective correspondence, F, um, that maps A to B, such that this relation holds. A1 is in relation A with A2, implies that F of A1 is in the relation B with F of A2. And um, an example of this would be just a function, a bijective function from, say, from 0, 1 to R. Uh, and let this function to x, I guess. And the order relation would be the same order relation, this one. So if you have a less than b, then you have 2a is less than 2b. And this would be f of a, f of b. And we can say these two have the same order relation. Um, another definition uh, would be the dictionary order relation. Um, and suppose A and B are two sets with order relations again, these two. Um, we can define an order relation on A, the Cartesian product of A and B, and this would be A1, B1 is less than A2, B2. If A1 is in order relation A with A2, or if A is equal to A1 is equal to A2, and B1 is in an order B with B2. And it's called the dictionary order relation. And it's the same thing as, uh, or for example, browsing a dictionary. If you want to order words, you say the first word, you see the first word, and if they have this, if like the first word is A, and the second starts with an A, and the second one starts with a B, the, the one that starts with an A would be uh, the first one, and the one that starts with B would be the second one. And if they both start with A, you'd look at the second word, and you, the second uh, letter, I mean, and you'd continue like this. Um, that's why, why it's called an, a dictionary order relation. And we can define now, uh, dictionary order relation on the set, uh, the Cartesian product of R and R, um, or the plane. And then you'd have the point, the point P is less than every point lying above it on a vertical line through the, the point P. 
Um, and then we have a, another definition that says that uh, it defines what a least upper bound is. And, uh, and well, we, we first need to know what an upper bound is. And for set to have an, well, let me just write this. Or I guess, um, Gaurav, are you going to go over this when you deal with integers and real number? Uh, I can do a little bit if you want me to. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, you talk about least upper bounds uh, and stuff in real numbers. But I just want to say that the least upper, upper bound property is not um, a property that only the real numbers have. You can define other sets with other different order relations that can have the least upper bound property. And uh, this concludes our, uh, our study of relations for the, the purposes of this textbook. And uh, we can take a break and then Gaurav would present the other parts. Uh, I have a request guys, can everyone um, come back in 10 minutes precisely because um, I have to go and um, it's all, also been going on for one hour, 15 minutes. Sure. So yeah, thank you. Thank you.
Okay, are people back? Um, I am back. I, um, it's been a minute. Um, I'll start in one minute now. Okay, so uh, I'll start now um, and I'm going to talk about um, Cartesian products first. Um, in the order of the chapter, there's integers um, and real numbers, which comes before Cartesian products. But uh, since Cartesian products are um, something we've already talked about a little bit, I thought it might be nice to uh, start with this. Uh, so let me start by a little motivation, which is to look at this situation, right? That suppose you go to an ice cream place and you have the following choice. Um, you wanna take a single scoop of ice cream and the menu is um, given to you as shown on the screen. So um, what are the choices that you have given the menu shown? Like what are the different ways that you can get ice cream? And um, can people please participate and reply? Um, that's also a way for me to know if um, people are here. Hello. Um, hey, so sorry, I thought I closed uh, my mic. <laughs> Nidhi, you were saying. So I'm just asking you, what are the different ways in which you can get ice cream given these options you have to exercise? Yeah, so you take one small cone, uh, strawberry ice cream. Okay, okay. Um, who else is here, guys? I am here. Okay, so given the circumstance, the situation, what are the different ways or like one way that you can order ice cream? So you can match, for example, the small cone to each flavor. Okay. Okay. Great. So. Um, Theodora, are you here? Yeah. So I, you can match small chocolate or medium chocolate and small banana and medium banana and small strawberry or medium strawberry, depending on what you want. Great, great. So a Cartesian product, if you just sort of play with this idea a little bit, is let's say you have A be the set, and, and this is not B, this is A too. I changed it, but um, sorry. Is, 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 is you know, a, if you take A1 and you have A2, then a Cartesian product is all of these possible choices that you have, right? So that's a very sort of basic intuitive definition or way of understanding what a Cartesian product is. Now, um, let's try to build this a little bit more. So we need a concept of an indexing function, which is let A be a non-empty collection of sets. So now, um, before I go further, let me just talk about this idea of a collection. So a collection is, is just um, a sort of set that contains other sets. Um, and this is something that uh, I think Nadir introduced, but didn't talk too much about. But um, the, the, the premise is that even sets can function as elements. And so an indexing function for a collection is a surjective function from a set J, which is called the index set, to the collection, right? And a collection has all these different elements, um, which are sets. Um, and it's called the index family of sets. So let's say that alpha belong, is in J, then we can show every family of set as A subscript alpha, where alpha belongs to J. Uh, and this is useful for us because um, 
we can um So let's say we expand this a little bit and we have these different sizes and these different flavors of ice cream and these different toppings that we can add, right? So then for the set A, it maps an index set J to every element in A as a subjective function or, or more properly put, um, that Although an indexing function is required to be subjective, it is, oh, this is something you should just be aware of. Um, let me just come back to this. So let M be a positive integer. Given a set X, we define an M tuple, which is of elements of X to be a function. This is just saying that there are different types of choices we can exercise in buying our ice cream, which is, you know, say, I don't know, um, the, the, the flavor, the size, um, the, I don't know, calorie count or whatever. And if X is an M tuple, we often denote the value of X at I by the symbol X I and I is in this case, uh, the indexing function, um, or the indexing set, um, which is the ith uh, coordinate of X. And we often denote the function X as the symbol X one, X two, X M. Now, if we take a sub one to a sub m. These are the family of sets that are indexed with the set one to m. And the Cartesian product is finally defined as a, as a product from i equals to one to m of a sub i or a one, uh, a, a, a two up till a m, which is the set of all m tuples of elements of x such that x sub i is in a i for each i. So this is in, in a very simple way, this is the set of all the different choices we can make um, as you guys observed in the first slide. Further, this can further be ge generalized into an infinite number of sets when we define um, a set X, which is the, the omega tuple of the elements of X where X maps from Z plus to X. And this is called a sequence or an infinite sequence of elements of X. Um, and we can denote X by the symbol X1, X2, or Xn, where N is in Z plus. So then in this case, the Cartesian product of this is denoted by I in Z, the, pro the Cartesian product of A sub I for mega tuples X1, X2, and so on. Um, so is that sort of clear? Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Um, so this is a very simple example that if R is the set of real numbers, then R M denotes the set of all M tuples of real numbers. It is often called Euclidean M space. Now, um, a way to think about this and, and, and a very simple way to think about it is if this is R, and this is where, where we have the idea of Cartesian coordinates in which we, we've learned maybe in like fifth grade, right? Is if you have um, real numbers on this line and real numbers on this line, then R2 is basically all of the collection of these points, which can be defined, let's say this point here, which is A, B, right? And this is a, um, M, M tuple with M equals two, where you have, um, you can define each point. And so a Euclidean M space similarly is just all of the different, um, if you have more um, R, um, more sets of R. Um, and R to, to omega is also, is subsequently the infinite dimensional Euclidean space. Now this is something I cannot draw um, to represent, but Essentially, it's the same idea, except it, it extends forever. So it's not a finite, there's no finite bound. Um, and, and this is what maps, th this is the set of all functions from, that map from Z plus to R. Um, so that's what Cartesian products are quite um, simply. So it's all the different combinations in which you can work with things. Um, and um, 
also it's it's important to note at this point that the idea of a collection is quite powerful because um it's it it shows that sets can also function as elements um so here is a very simple exercise uh, which I, which is solved and subsequently there is another exercise which is not solved um i will share this presentation with you and i i encourage you to sort of work with this um and um i will share that i will i can definitely share solutions later if that goes um so the first is to show there is a bijective correspondence between a with the cartesian product b and with b with the cartesian product a now can somebody tell me on a very intuitive level what does this mean like what does this correspondence what is it to asking to show a bijective correspondence So it would be like a function of two variables that maps the A and B to like to mm -hmm. B and A or something like that, I guess. That's right. And and like Nadir showed that, you know, to show bijective, we need to show it's one to one and on two or or in injection and surjection essentially, right? And which we can do with taking A1, B1 and A2, B2 then you have a function g of a1 b1 which gives which is also the same as g of a2 b2 and this implies that b1 a1 is b2 a2 which implies a1 b1 is a2 b2 now on to you can show as as the following you have a function g of a comma b which maps uh, for every where every a is in the set a every element a is in the set a and every b is in the is in the set b then you have this following relationship th this is following function hold which is b a is in b a where b uh, where, where b a the, the the tuple b a belongs to um, it, it is in b cartesian product with a so if you can show one to one and on to this is what you get um and this is another exercise um which is similar which asks um you to show that if m and n belong to z plus um and the the set x is not an empty set um if m is less than equal to n find an injective map uh function that maps x m to x n um again i encourage you to think about this um a little bit and the rest we can i will i will share the presentation and you can um s sort of uh, solve on your own so um so it's hard for me to draw um does anybody have any ideas as to how to attempt this um can we let the the first like and like the first m tuples be the same in xn and the rest be zeros oh uh, yes would, would okay. that work um okay so that's partly what you can do um uh, again um it's very it's it's essentially asking that um you you have to have both x sets being not an empty set and you can have the zeros yes so that works um so um i'll leave the rest of the exercises um for you to do so i'll just share the presentation since i'm also a little bit in a rush but um i i hope you get the 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 larger idea of what a cartesian product is um so integers and real numbers um so in the book integers and real numbers are tackled in this way where we have um this assumption and a basic definition um there are and, and the book specifies this that there are two ways to tackle um the question of what are integers and what are real numbers uh one is to build this up axiom build up the the axioms using um logic uh however this is not done so um that's that's another way to do it which is quite interesting actually um but uh we'll not go there um but it gives is the other way is to use this assumption that there exists a set r which we call the set of real numbers um 
where two binary operations, um, this and this on R, called addition and multiplication operations, uh, are, 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 are possible. And there is an order relation on R such that the following properties hold. And the properties are as what I'll just show you. Um, so, um, and these are basic algebraic properties, which is to say that um, if x plus y plus z, e then, then it's equal to x plus y plus z. Um, and x times y times z is x times y times z for all x, y in R and so on. These are like elementary properties. Um, I, I don't know. I, you can have a look at this. I, I don't think it's worth me reading this. Uh, so it's saying that the sum with zero gives itself and then there's a unique element in R called one, which um, the product with which gives the element itself. Um, also the product of a sum, product with a sum is the sum of the product for all X, Y, Z. Um, and then these are some other properties um, regarding order. So if X is greater than Y, then X plus Z is greater than Y plus Z um, for X, Y, Z in um, R. And the same with if X is greater than Y and Z is greater than zero, then X times Z is greater than Y times Z. Um, so let's look at some, some definition of, of what integers are. Um, so integers are defined or can be defined as a, so, so, so the way to define integers is to use this idea of inductive, something that is inductive and contains the number one. Um, so we say that A is a subset of real numbers if it contains the number one and for every X in A, X plus one is also in A. Um, where A is the collection of all inductive subsets of R. Um, so this makes, does this make some sense? So it's essentially saying there is some kind of collection which contains one and every other X plus one. Um, so for, for, for all, um, for every X in A. So each element is the next X. And so you have um, what you call um, the set, Z plus of positive integers defined as um, this right here, where it's part it is every A is in the collection A. Um, and so the set of Z of integers is the set consisting of the positive integers as well as the number zero. And, and this is the difference of why we write integers as so and um, positive integers as so. Basically, this is just saying without, without, um, it's, it's hard for me to write, but without um, zero. And further, we can prove that the uh, sum difference and product of two integers are integers which is again another exercise um, for one to consider and that the set Q of quotients of integers is called the set of rational numbers. Um, um, these are just essentially definitions. Uh, and again, I think all of this is something very, uh, like most of us would have seen before in, in some form. And this brings us to this concept of um, well ordering property, which is which is as, as the first proof we'll see. So the, the the theorem says that every non-empty subset of Z plus has a smallest element. Um, so there is one way to see this um, as a proof. Uh, one way for me to understand it was to see um, this idea in computer science, where you know we we look at what is the smallest in every um, sort of uh, subset, which is an, is part of the set, until we have sort, sorted the elements. Now um, we can prove this by the following: that for every n that belongs to Z plus, there is a non-empty set um, one uh, one to n that has the smallest element. If there is a 
which is the set of all positive integers for which the statement holds, then if it contains one, if n equals to one, then the only non-empty subset is the set one itself. Then it, let's say it contains n, we can show that it contains n plus one because um, the way we have defined it is um, to contain x plus one, right? That's how we defined the in integers um, previously. So, um, so then let C be a non-empty subset of, this, of the set one, two, n plus one. If C consists of the single element n plus one, then that element is the smallest element, which, which makes sense, right? Because if this is the only element in a, in a sorry, in a subset, um, that will be the, the smallest element. So then C intersection with one to, one to n, which is a non-empty set, uh, will, will, uh, will be, because of this, will have the smallest element, which is the smallest element of C as well. And thus, A is inductive, right? So this is, we're using induction to show that um, there is A, which equals Z plus, which is true for all Z plus. Um, for the, um, if we prove that D is a non-empty subset of Z plus, then we choose an element N of D, then the set A equals D intersection one to N is non-empty. So that A has the smallest element K. And then the K is the smallest element of D as well. Uh, I think this is a little um, confusing for me um, to follow like this, but I'll just hold the slide. And um, if people have a look, I think it's, it's quite intuitive um, to understand. Um, so I'll just wait for 20 seconds. Um, do people understand? Yeah, I think you can just go to the okay. next slide. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So this is uh, the, the, the strong induction principle, which is to say that if, if A is a set of positive integers, then each positive integer in N, uh, the statement SN is, is in A, implies the statement that N is in A, then A is equal to Z plus. Um, and this follows from theor theorem 4.1, where, you know, if A does not equal all of Z plus, then N will be the smallest positive integer that is not in A. And, and so there is every positive integer less than N is in A, which, which is a, a contradiction to um, the, the, the hypothesis that that, that N is in A. Um, so this is again, some exercises, um, which um, I encourage you to attempt. I'll share the presentation um, and I can, I'll, I'll share solutions. Some of these are quite, quite straightforward. They're just using the axioms from one to five. Um, so like if X plus Y equals X, then Y equals zero, which is, is quite almost the axiom itself. Which is saying that there is an element zero, which which added to another element gives gives the element itself, um, and and so forth. Um, so so moving on, finite sets. So um, here there is something before we define what a finite set is. I think it's worth asking the question: um, What is an infinite set? You know, what are words that you would say probably try to if I asked you to define what is a finite set without any knowledge, what would you try to say? Um, and this is, these are questions I would ask you, um, people. Theodora, maybe. Um, like an infinite set would be something which has no borders and like okay. no end. Okay. Okay. Um, let me try to write that down. Um, uh, Neil, what would you say? I'd say a finite set is a set where you can count the number of elements. Okay. Um, Nadir, I don't know. What would your intuition say, like without like a mathematical understanding, what would you like to say about this? Yeah, I would, I would most likely say that it's uh, a set that I can like list the elements of the set and like count them. 
Okay. You Sorry got for it. the no border thing. Can you just take off the border thing? I just realized it's it doesn't make sense neither in finite or infinite sense. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Um, the point is to. I wanted to say that when you listen, count them. Uh, you'd reach um like a number and. Yeah. So you wouldn't keep going until you can okay. stop. Okay. 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 So let's look at what it really is. Um, so a set is set to be finite if there is a bijective correspondence of a with some section of the positive integers. That is, a is finite if it is empty or if there is a bijection which, which maps from a to 1 to n for some positive finite n, right? And, and a way to think about this is it's, it's essentially a subset of, 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 z, of, of z in this case. Um, so we say that a has cardinality 0 in the latter case, or it has cardinality n for any non-zero n for some positive integer n, which is the same as what we said. It's it's in some sense countable or listable, right? Um, so the first lemma that this gives us is that let n be a positive integer. Then um, if a is a set with a zero being an element of a, then there exists a bijective correspondence of f with the set one to n plus one, if and only if there exists a bijective correspondence of the function or, or, or a correspondence g of the set a minus a zero with the set one to n. So this is saying that if there are n plus one elements, then there has to be a bijective correspondence um, f if and only if there is in some way to map um, the first n elements um, using a function g. Um, so that's what, it, what we're trying to prove, right? So let g be the function which maps a minus the, the, the first element um, of, of a to 1 to n. Then we have to define a function which maps um, every um, element in a to 1 to n plus 1 by setting f of x equals g of x for x in a minus a zero or the first element of the set a, then f of a zero is n plus one, um, which is bijective, right? And to prove the converse, we need to hold, um, we need to assume there is a bijective correspondence. So let's say that f maps from a to one to n plus one. Um, then if f maps from a zero to the number n plus one, things are sort of easy, right? Because we have this, this restriction in the case. Um, and, and so we get the bijective correspondence from a minus a zero with one to n. Now, um, one way to sort of understand this a little bit is, um, if I have this set, right. And, and if I, if this works, in the case, then n, n plus one, there is another added element here, right? And so it has to map this. So this mapping um, has to work for this um, subsequent mapping to work. I, I'm sorry, this, this is really a bad diagram, but um, this mapping has to work for this mapping to subsequently work is, is the, the, the basic premise of this. Um, and, and so we have this, this new function, which we can define, which maps from a to n plus one, where h of a zero is n plus one, right? So in this case, what we're saying is a zero is the n plus one element to which it maps, um, which, which will ensure that we have a bijective correspondence because bijective is both one to one and onto which, which, which needs to function. Um, uh, and so, this gives us um, the next theorem, which is um, let A be a set. Suppose that there exists a bijection which maps from A, uh, sorry, which maps from A to one to N. So every element in A is mapped um, to, from one to N for some N in Z plus. Then let B be a proper subset of A. Um, note that this idea of a proper subset means that it's not um, the same as A. It, 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 it contains um, 
uh, the cardinality of b is lower than 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 a then there exists no bijection which maps from b to n elements right you can't map if you have fewer elements here you can't map to greater elements and still have a bijection um which is provided that b is not the empty set right because if it's the empty set then this will work um so so this is just how we define this theorem um there does exist a bijection which maps b to m elements for some m less than n um and 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 this is just saying that like if we have a certain number of elements in the set a then if we take a subset of that if this is a and we were to take a subset of a which is a proper subset right um then we can't we can have a bijection to some m which has to be less than m is is the is what the theorem is saying and and the way to prove this is is to take the case um uh first of 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 b being the empty set in this case there cannot exist a bijection of the empty set with a non empty set um so you can't have if there is no element in b you can't map it to something um in in a way to get a bijection um and then we prove the rest of the theorem by induction um so we can and 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 the 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 way we do this is let c be the subset of z plus consisting of integers from n for which the theorem holds um we can show that c is inductive and from this we conclude that c equals z plus so the theorem is true for all positive integers um which again is i think straightforward um these are certain corollaries which come out from theorem 4.6.2 um so it says that if a is finite then there is no bijection of a with a proper subset of itself um so this is just this follow this follows from the preceding theorem right that if you say b is a proper subset of a then f from a to b is a bijection we we take this assumption right but then this means that there is a bijection which maps a to n elements for some n and g of f inverse is then a bijection of b with 1 to n which is a contradiction so um essentially you can't map to uh, or you can't have a bijection with uh, more elements given that one is a proper subset of itself um again the next is is this is a little this is an interesting one which is to say that z plus is not finite you're trying to say that integers are not finite and the way to show this is that there is a function f which maps to z plus minus 1 uh, minus the first element or some element which is defined by f of n to n plus 1 um which is a bijection of z plus with a proper subset of itself uh sorry um um and the next corollary from this is uh okay so so the next corollary is the cardinality of a finite set is uniquely determined by a so again card cardinality is like you know the the premise that we show, showed previously that that let m be less than n then there has to be a bijection for which the function works right so f maps from 1 to from a to 1 to n n elements and then g has to map from a to 1 to m elements if g is a proper subset uh, if if g, g if g is using a proper subset of a then the the composite g of f inverse has to map um from 1 to n to 1 to m which is a bijection of the finite set 1 to n with a proper subset of itself which is a contradiction of the corollary we just proved um um these are certain other coroll corollaries which follow um i encourage you to prove them yourself um as exercises um they're quite straightforward um if you follow 
with uh, the the previous proofs. Um, so one is just saying that if B is a subset of the finite set, then B is finite. Um, and you can show this by showing that uh, if if given that A is finite um, and it's a bijective mapping, then you can take another function um, which takes A subset, which will also be bijective. And um, if B is a proper subject, then cardinality of B is less than the cardinality of A is, is, is again, uh, follows from that. Uh, further, uh, the next corollary is that if B is a non-empty set, then uh, the following are equ equivalent, which is to say that if B is finite, there is a surjective function from a section of positive integers onto B, and there's an injective function from B into a section of positive integers. This is just the definition of, of bijection, right? So it has to be both surjective and injective uh, onto, the, onto a section of the positive integers. Um, finally, the corollary 6.8 is that finite unions and finite Cartesian products of finite sets are finite. Um, this is slightly um, trickier, um, but it can be worked with the definition of what we saw a Cartesian product is. Um, in the first part. Um, so I, I, I now encourage you to work with this exercise. Um, so um, if I ask you to make a list of the injective maps from um, F1, 2, 3, 2, F1, 2, 3, 4, and show that none is bijective, um, how would you attempt this? This should be quite straightforward. Aya? Hey, so, well, I think what, what you can basically do is like show that and none of the, like, since it would be a subjective map. And so if it's not subjective, it's not, not like bijective. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and yeah, basically because you don't have like, any of the bijective maps from three to four, you show that the cardinality of four is bigger than the cardinality of three. Exactly. Um, okay. And 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 that's exactly how you do it. So um, the a, a, the most important thing to sort of think about when you're talking with finite sets, this this helps me conclude with this point, is um, the importance of bijective as being both injective and surjective. And so in any proof, um, if you were to show something is not bijective, you need to consider either to, to show that it's either not injective or not subjective and, and therefore you can conclude. Um, and that concludes my part of the work. Um, and I will now share this presentation and um, I encourage you to sort of consider the remaining exercises. So I think uh, we've worked through all the question once in all the exercises. Um, and the second question is, is, is a way to, um, for you to sort of review um, this material. And I will share solutions if you would like me to do so. Um, but I, I, I would rather not like um, have people, because like the second question is likely, like not this, but um, one of the proofs uh, before is slightly more tricky. So it's best for people to set, take some time on their own um, and do it rather than I think like attempt it here. So that's, that's um, my part. Um, thank you. So I would be uh, presenting uh, section 1.7. Wait, I, do, you, do you want to say something? Nope, sorry. I was just saying thanks to Gora. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Gora. Uh, so um, 1.7 deals with countable and uncountable sets. And we first present a definition. Yeah, a definition for what um, an infinite set. And is um, so I just want to say that um, like for um, finite sets, um, the set one, this set. So there's an example. Like if you find a bijection, a bijection from this set to set A, that means that that is a finite set. So that was the the fundamental idea of what a finite set is, and it's finding bijections. 
So an infinite set is, um, let me, an infinite set is literally a set that is not uh, finite. So there is no bijection between it and uh, the section SN of real numbers. Um, and however, there are like infinite sets that are still countable. And for these sets, the, the prototype is the set uh, Z plus, just like SN served for the previous section. And we define, and we proved before that uh, the set of all positive integers is infinite. So now we said, say that um, countable, countably, infinite, a countably infinite set We say that a set is countably infinite if there is a bijective map f from a to the set of positive real numbers, uh, real uh, positive integers. Um, if there is an, a biject is bijective. So if we can find a map that maps our set a to the set z plus, that means that it is countably infinite. So it is infinite, but it's still countable. Um, so an example would be this set, which is not very surprising because since it is a subset, um, it is a subset of uh, real, it is a subset of uh, positive integers. So it, it has to have like a cardinality that is smaller, but in a sense it has the same cardinality, although it is infinite, but it's, it's, very ambiguous what I'm saying, but they have the same, like you can find the bijective map from this to Z, to Z. Although if you can say that Z plus has like numbers one, two, three, and it looks like they're smaller, but they're the same. You can find the bijective map, which is very interesting. Um, so then we define what we mean by a countable set. And the set is countable if it is either finite or countably infinite. Um, and if a set is not countable, we say that it's uncountable. So then we have a theorem that sort of tells us how to find if a set is countable or not. We don't need to find like a bijection. We can do other things. So the theorem states that um, a not uh, that will let B be a non-empty set, and then the following are equivalent. So we have one is equivalent to two, and it's equivalent to three. So let's say one is that B is countable. And countable means that it's either countably infinite or uh, finite. So, and two, that means there is a surjective map. Surjection. Surjective function of f from the set of positive integers to b. And the third one is that there is an injective function G from E to the set of positive integers. And uh, a proof, to prove this, we just say that, we just prove that one implies two, and that two implies three, and that three implies one, and then we have the equivalence of all the statements. And it's not very hard to prove that one implies two. And um, I, can, I can write the proof here for all of them or if, because we don't have much time, I'm just gonna skip it. I think my proof is similar to the one in the textbook. Um, so I'm, you can just refer to the textbook if you wanna do the proof. Um, yeah, so then we have a lemma um, that says that if C is an infinite subset, of Z plus, it is countably infinite.
Um, so this this is just like the set that we said of the odd integers or even integers, positive integers. They are countably infinite because they are infinite subsets of C plus. And uh, a proof would uh, we would take a subset of Z that is infinite, and then we would try to find uh, a bijection, or we can find we can use the previous theorem that I stated. We can find a subjective function from Z plus to the set C, or an injective function from C to Z plus. Um, and the proof uses uh, to find this function. We uh, the proof is also in the textbook. The proof is um, the same as the one in the textbook. This one. Um, and uh, it uses, we defined uh, the function h recursively. And what recursively means is that we defined it in terms of it, we defined like the terms h of n in terms of n minus one. That there was some, like as a function of n minus one. And I guess most of you saw this if you took uh, calculus or 205 course that dealt with uh, uh, sequences at first when you defined like a n plus one is equal uh, n over two. So this is defining uh, like the, the image of n plus one as a, a function of n. So this is what recursive means. And there is a principle of recursive uh, definition. Um, and uh, in the proof, we defined h of one as being smallest element of C and h i as being smallest element of this set, C minus. So this is kind of a hint if you want to do the proof yourself. This is how you would define the function, sort of rearranging the terms in terms of smallest one, like Gorov out said about the proof of the previous, um, in uh, one of his theor the theorem that he presented. So let me give you what the principle of recursive definition is. So A is a set. So we give a formula, given a formula, that defines H1 as a unique element of A. So H1, we define H1 as a unique element of A. And in in terms of the values of h for positive integers. Then we define for i that is larger than one, we define h i in terms in terms of the values of h for n in a and n less than i no n is not in a n is in z plus h i is in a again it's a unique element of a um and thus we have the mapping uh this formula determines the unique function and it's a function from z plus to a and this is how we define a function by the principle of recursive definition. Then we have a corollary um, that says a subset of a countable set. Is also countable. Um, Again, I, we don't have much time. The proof is in the textbook, but it's uh, simple. We, since um, let, well, let A be a subset of B and B is countable. Um, if it's finite, then we're done. But if it's infinite, then we can find a function from B to Z plus, and it would be an injective function. Injective function, 
and then we just restrict f to a and this would be our new injective function it's f restricted to a to z and then that means that b is uh, countable countably in infinitely countable um then we have another corollary that says that c plus and c plus is countably infinite And again, a proof of this is not very hard. We just have to find an injective function again. For f, the, the maps z, the Cartesian product of the set of real, of uh, integers to the set of integers, positive integers. Um, and um, there is a formula for this uh, function that we can define a function like this. Of m, this is a function of two variables, and it's two to the m. Sorry. F of m and n is two to the m times three to the n, and we can show that this is an injective function by, uh, yeah, we can show easily that it's an injective. Function. Um, then we have a set of other theorems. Um, I'm not going to write them because my writing, my, my handwriting is very bad, but I'm going to say them and I'm not going to tell you the proof. You can go and look at the proof because the proof um, is exactly the one in the textbook. So I would just be reading, if I told you what the proof is, I would just be reading what the textbook is saying. And you can just do that because we don't have much time. So um, a countable union of countable sets is also countable. And a finite product of countable sets is countable. And uh, another theorem is that if x uh, is the here. element, by yeah. the way, do you, maybe maybe you can just like tell tell us proofs like next time because like I understand it's like reading from textbook, but also like this reading seminar is kind of about reading the textbook, but like together. So I think it would still make yeah. sense for the proof, but just like next time maybe. Oh, so oh yeah yeah oh, yeah I could do that. Oh, because okay, I, I so then I could do the all the proofs if you want now. Like sure, because we still have time next time because like it's it's pretty flexible. If you'll need more time, we'll just give it to you next week. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, so I'll just mention the theorems and then I'll go into the proofs next time. So uh, if we let X denote the set, then X to the omega, which is the infinite Cartesian product, the Cartesian product of x times x infinitely. Um, this is an uncountable set. And then the last theorem is that if A is a set, there is no injective map. Let me rewrite this better. There is no injective map that maps from the power set of A to A. And there is no, sur or a surjective map the maps from G, that a surjective map G that maps from A to the power set of A. And that is the last theorem of uh, 1.7. And um, uh, I guess we should stop now. And um, I'll do the proofs next time.